we've heard a lot this afternoon from educators from kindergarten up to university. I was a, 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 a teacher in a primary school, the same primary school I went to when I was three. I, I, I taught there for 15 years and I became the vice, vice principal. And then I was an, a member of parliament, the British parliament, for 18 years. Some say I swapped one set of bells and playground behavior for another set of bells and playground <laughs> behavior. In 1987, our school was being inspected. The staff got the jitters, the head got the school nurse in, and she taught us meditation. Just tension and release, the body scan, not mindfulness. It worked for me, and I passed it on to the children in my class. 39 children in, in, in my class in those days, who were nine and 10 year olds. So I, uh, and, uh, I used it in a whole range of activities in school, and I still get 40-year-olds coming up to me now saying that they're still meditating after having that. In 2007, my daughter, 12-year-old daughter, Seren, was doing comparative religions, and I came across mindfulness. I knew about uh, Buddhism, uh, but I'd never really looked at mindfulness, and I made the con uh, connection with meditation, and I started practicing. I downloaded Gil Fronsdale's uh, uh, pod podcast from uh, Spirit Rock, and listen to those in the car on the, on the drive down to the Parliament and on the drive back. And they really worked for me. They gave me the gifts, the gifts of the mind, the gifts that you will all have, have been touched with, the gifts of presence, of appreciation, of gratitude. For the past three and a half years, I've been keeping a gratitude diary, filling in it two or three times a week, noticing. I'm a, quite an ex uh, uh, quite a, a kinesthetic person. I move a lot. I, I'm agitated and excited. But... I've only recently come to know stillness and silence. And silence is important. Silence is important for all of us. There's a, a, a philosopher called Blaise, Blair Pascal who said, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And it's bad enough for the individual, but if politicians don't do it, they magnify their mistakes 10 or a million times over. So the, the, and other gifts of connection, communion, curiosity, Balance, peace, compassion, self-compassion, kindness, loving kindness, all of these gifts I have experienced through mindfulness. My curiosity in mindfulness and well-being extended to, to parliaments. I put down parliamentary questions. 32.3% of children between 15 and young people of 25 in the UK have one or more psychiatric problem. In the US, I learned yesterday, it's 40%. There's been a 500% increase in the issuing of prescription, uh, antidepressant uh, prescriptions in the UK. 400% over a 20 year period, 400% in the US. 9% of British children have ADHD, 11% in the US. 90% of our pr prisoners have one or more psychiatric condition. They are literally a captive audience and we're letting them fester and rot when we could be giving them mindfulness. The World Health Organization say about 2030, that mindful, that men, mental ill health will build, be the biggest health burden on the whole of the planet. A burden for the individual, his family, and for society. And we can lessen that burden through mindfulness. Now there are many causes, or many reasons, why people and society and the whole world is being thrown off balance. I don't want to go into them, but I'll just mention some of them. Some, like the uh, psychiatrist Oliver James, See, it's because of advertising. 600 billion pound a year, 600 billion dollars a year worldwide is spent on advertising. 200 billion in the US alone. The purpose of an advert is to make you unhappy. Unhappy with what you've got so you'll purchase something else. So there's a 600 billion pound industry trying to make us unhappy. Some say it's community breakdown. The American writer uh, Robert Putnam in his brilliant book Bowling Alone said, at five o'clock, people draw up the drawbridge in their homes. They retire into their homes. Sometimes they retire into separate bedrooms. And that sense of community and social cement is going. Some say it's digital distraction, information overload, our economy, our work-life balance. You know, we're on that hedonic treadmill where, where we are spending money we haven't got on goods we don't need to impress people we don't like. <laughs> And it's all in the name of keeping our children and our, uh, and our spouses happy. And that's what our spouses and children want, is presence, is connection. Some say it's rampant individualism, the me and the we, which we've heard about. The atomization of society through globalization, materialism, consumerism. You know, born, work, consume, die is no way to live. And mindfulness, I believe, is the key to help us live a better balanced life. Now, I, um, we've heard the, 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 the saying, uh, be the change you want to see, 
from Gandhi, and I felt this after three and a half years of practicing mindfulness, I wanted to take this to Parliament. To give, it was a gift. Mindfulness was a gift I was given, and I wanted to pass it on. And I contacted Professor Lord Richard Layard, who is a, a, a world expert on happiness, and he knew Professor Mark Williams from Oxford University. Mark Williams and um, Chris Cullen came down and taught uh, the initial le lesson to 22 uh, members of Parliament and British Lords. Lords. It was the eight-week uh, MBCT for, uh, uh, course that we followed, one and a half hours practice a week uh, over an eight-week period, home practice, and as I say, uh, 130 MPs and Lords, and 220 members of their staff have had it as well. So we developed our own personal practice in Parliament. We then wanted to turn the personal into the political, into policy. How could we, as people in the centre of government, making change, making laws, making legislation, make mindful legislation, because there is good practice out there. Professor Mark Williams in 2004 proved the science that for repeat episode depression, that mindfulness is better than antidepressants in the treatment of that specific disease, of that spe specific illness. So it's been proven it's the only country in the world that prescribes it, and why is that? It's been there for 12 years. As a politician, I want to send it out to other politicians around, to, uh, around the world. Look at this. Look at the science. See if it's readily adoptable for your country. So we looked at policy, and as Mo has mentioned, we've looked, uh, developed this book, Mindful Nation. And it's, uh, we had eight evidence sessions on education, workplace, health, and criminal justice from eight, 80 witnesses from around the world. And there are 220 scientific references in the back of it. It's the, the science is absolutely thorough and up to date. And we've well, and woven in, the, in this book are the personal testimonies of the lives that have been turned around by mindfulness. It's an excellent book. It's freely avail available on the web for nothing. You just Google Mindful Nation and you'll have access to all of that science, all of that policy. And the recommendations we made in this report were achievable. It was, it was visionary to a certain extent, but it's practical. There were asks that we knew could be delivered, and we've made progress on that over the past six months. We are having mindfulness uh, um, kind of hothoused through the IAP, the Incre Improved Access to Psychological Therapies program in the UK, one of the best programs in the world. We're having mindfulness introduced into our prisons, and we've got senior uh, civil servants looking at, looking at that, and we're having mindfulness in the civil service. Now, it's a big issue how we translate this document or how we get it out to other countries around the world. And I think the MPs uh, that we have in the UK are prepared to pass the message on. And one of the great... We were asked before what, what are the things that we've learned from this conference. One of the th things that I've learned from this conference, what I'm going to take away, is what a great man that t Congressman Tim Ryan is. We met with Tim, uh, Jamie and I met with Tim on, uh, on Thursday, and he, he wants to work with us to spread mindfulness to other uh, countries, to other nations. Um, 18 months ago, I went to the Dutch Parliament and helped to in introduce mindfulness to Dutch MPs. 30 of the 150 Dutch MPs have had mindfulness training. 20% of that legislature has had mindfulness training. Um, we've introduced it in Wales, in the National Assembly for Wales. Uh, last September, I went to the Australian Parliament, and they intend to introduce it after the Australian elections this year. Uh, in June, I am going out to the French Parliament to try and introduce it there. If Britain stays in the Euro European Union, I will be going out to help to introduce it into the European Union. That's 508 million people in 28 nations. If we can plonk mindfulness in the center of that decision-making there, you know, we can spread mindfulness. We can make sure that the misery that is out there can be lessened. Uh, <laughs> later in the year, I'll be visiting, the, hopefully visiting the Irish Doyle, uh, the Irish Parliament, to see if we can get mindfulness in the Irish Parliament, and perhaps the Northern Ireland Parliament. And Tara uh, Brach made reference uh, yesterday to you know, the issues that stretch back 900 years in Ireland. Uh, and... I think mindfulness can have a, a role to play in lessening conflict, conflict and improving reconciliation. There is interest in uh, Morocco, in uh, the United Emir Arab 
Emirates, and I think that mindfulness is being introduced to the staff of the Knesset. So it has its role to play in the Middle East as well. So I think if we can look at best practice around the world, and it's not just the UK that has got best practice, you have best practice here in the, in, in the US, the MFIT program which you've used for your uh, United States Marines to stabilize those young soldiers before they go into an area of conflict, so that when they come back, that, so when they go out there, that they are in control of their emotions, they're in control of their weaponry, and when they come back, they are better sons uh, or daughters and fathers and members of society. You have best practice here. In Australia, Professor Craig Hassad is using mindfulness in the universities to help student doctors and student teachers to keep them balanced. They noticed, noticed that when their student doctors went out on their first placements, to a hospital, between 50 and 75% of them suffered with stress, anxiety, or depression. Now, they've had this in, in place in Monash University for a quarter of a century. Why haven't we got it in every university in the world? No, it's our job as politicians <laughs> to try and spread this best practice. We've, we've heard from lots of educators today and I think uh, Pat Jennings said before, there is not conclusive scientific evidence for mindfulness in education. There's reports here which say it's very good and that it's had a good effect. Oxford University last year got $10 million from the Wellbeing Trust to monitor the scientific effect of mindfulness on 11 to 18 year olds over a seven year period. And this is, going to, this is going to be conducted, or this was started by Professor Mark Williams, the man who proved the science in the health service 12 years ago. And I think the research will be as thorough as, uh, as, uh, as it was 12 years ago. If that is the case, then that needs to be replicated around the world. If we can inoculate our children from the age of five, from kindergarten, up to the age of 21, 22, 25, if you're going to be a doctor, in that critical period, give me the child, give me the boy till the age of seven, and I'll give you the man. At the moment, the computers are giving the boy. Our, our TV screens are giving the boy. Our adver advertisers are giving the boy. What we need is mindfulness to have an impact on those young minds so they become better individuals and better citizens. So don't leave it to the scientists, though. Don't leave it to the, just to the politicians or even former politicians. Tim Ryan, in his book, an excellent book, and he was a bit, he didn't want to uh, kind of promote it yesterday, I'll promote it for him. <laughs> he looks at mindfulness in, every, uh, in many, many areas, and at the end of every chapter is a list of recommendations for what the reader can do. I'm always asked the questions, what will you take away? There's been 700 people here at this conference today, and if we all go away and we create our collective ripples around this nation and around the countries we've come from, then we'll be doing mindfulness a service. On the other side, we have the pharma industry, which is worth a half a trillion dollars a year. $20 billion a year is spent on PR, on GR, and on, on, on lobbying. The Mindfulness Initiative, which is a fantastic organization led by this man, is Jamie working two days a week in a basement <laughs> in Haggerston in London. And he's even been kicked out of there recently. <laughs> you know, it's a David and Goliath struggle, but together, Scientists, politicians, practitioners, visionaries, but most of all, you, mindfulness advocates, members of the public, professionals, working together, we can achieve not only a mindful nation, but a mindful world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm, I have the real honor of, of essentially working perhaps for one of the first ever mindfulness think tanks. So, so like working in that interaction, that space between the policy world and the mindfulness field. So I spent the last few years trying to understand um, the mindfulness field deeply and also get my head around this, this crazy world of, of the House of Commons um, and all these politicians who I found are people too. Um, and they, they, they suffer just like us in, in very similar ways and, and uh, they joined the mindfulness course um, for their own benefit and it was very important for us to keep a separation between the mindfulness teaching program 
and the policy program. And only if they sort of naturally have the interest do they kind of come and join the political conversation. But part of my job is, is kind of you know, dragging them in, the, in, in that direction. So uh, I've got a little um, prepared um, speech today because I, I want to leave some time um, for you to, 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 to reflect um, back to us. And there's so much I want to say. I want to, I want to, I want to make sure that I, that I get it into a, um, yeah, a, sh a short segment. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, dive straight into that, but um, yeah, I'm hopefully leaving about 15 minutes or so to, to have, a, have a dialogue. Okay, so I, I'd like to start by really paying tribute to Chris and his vision, enthusiasm, and, and, and bravery in what he's done. Uh, without that, there wouldn't have been a Mindful Nation report, an inquiry, an all-party group, or even a teaching program in the House of Parliament. Chris began as a lone champion but there are, now, there are now scores of politicians carrying the torch that he lit, each motivated by the insights gained in their personal practice. And this, I think, reflects how mindful, the mindfulness movement has developed so far. As Jim and Mirabai said yesterday, how and where mindfulness practice is introduced is largely in the hands of individual advocates. It's caught and not taught, some are saying. And it's increasing profile as a grassroots phenomenon. So even though we're now at least being heard by government, the propagation of mindfulness training could not and should not become a top-down process. Yes, we're talking to the UK Secretary of State for Education about how she can catalyze all this interest in mindfulness at a school level. But it's probably not a good idea to put it on the curriculum, even if that was an option. Because if a school were compelled to teach mindfulness without staff who have a personal practice, the likely outcomes will be resistance, misunderstanding, and dilution. <laughs> Personal practice must underpin effective mindfulness teaching, and central policy work can only play a role in the context of a, of a robust social movement. Having said that, there are levers that national and federal institutions can pull to ensure that mindfulness, sorry, to, to ensure that the mindfulness field develops in a healthy way. For example, in funding, preventing an increase in health inequality that would be inevitable were mindfulness to become the exclusive pastime of the educated and financially secure. So the Mindful Nation UK report made considered and realistic recommendations for how mindfulness training could be applied across UK services and institutions over the next few years. Recommendations that address specific objectives within their particular policy areas. In healthcare, it was recurrent depression, primarily. In education, improving well-being. In criminal justice system, tackling the problems related to reoffending. And in advocating these recommendations, they found natural homes within a number of emerging political narratives. I'd like to briefly offer some examples of these, of these narratives now, but then I'd like to suggest how we might find an entirely distinct place for mindfulness in the policy landscape, one which recognizes the insights that mindfulness practice <coughs> gives us as so foundational to human flourishing that legislators ought perhaps always to take them into account. The first of these existing narratives concerns the concepts of mental capital and the core economy. In short, policymakers are beginning to consider how the mind and the qualities of the mind relate to productivity and broad resilience in our society. Back in 2008, the UK government's Foresight Report emphasized the importance of mental capital to a 21st century knowledge-based economy. Roughly speaking, this equates to a, uh, a person's cognitive and emotional resources. The report, the report claimed mental capital can determine the capacity of an individual to contribute to society and also to experience a high quality of life. It seems obvious where mindfulness comes in here. And assuming you've heard about the cognitive and emotional benefits associated with training, I won't bore you with a list. But what's really interesting is that uh, phrases like mental capital give us a hard-nosed, econometric policy language to describe the, bro the broad human flourishing we see when people engage in sustained practice. Meanwhile, terms like core economy or hidden wealth are emerging amongst policymakers who are waking up to the value of the care that we give each other for free. From doing the laundry to taking the kids to school, to checking in on a neighbor and helping an elderly relative, nearly half of American productive work goes on outside of the market economy. 
and is not represented in production measures of GB, uh, such as GDP. And since these activities are broadly about caring for each other, and caring is largely about relating, where we can improve the quality of our presence, the quality of our, the attention that we give each other, we are developing the, co the nation's core economy. The association between mindfulness training and, the, and quality of care led a different uh, UK cross-party group, the all-party parliamentary group on uh, well-being economics, to recommend that mindfulness training be provided to teachers and to doctors to improve the resilience of their compassion and the quality of their relating. And in fact, we have to admit they beat us to it by about six months. A second associated political narrative is that around well-being. Increasingly, influential voices are calling for a radical rethink in the way that we measure success. Arianna Huffington and her third metric campaign is one example. The Gross National Happiness Center from Bhutan is another. In the UK, we have the New Economics Foundation. Their arguments for putting well-being at the center of policymaking are starting to gain traction. In part, this is because although the UK's gross domestic product has nearly doubled in 40 years, people's satisfaction with life has hardly changed. 81% of Britons now believe that the government should prioritize creating greater happiness rather than greater wealth. In 2010, the UK became one of the first nations to establish a national well-being measure, providing an alternative to GDP as, an, as a measure of how well the country is doing. The UK government has also funded the What Works Centre for Wellbeing, which, as the name suggests, aims to establish what the best approaches are for improving quality of life. So mindfulness has become an important touchstone in this conversation, partly thanks to research by the New Economics Foundation using huge quantities of data. They identified five evidence-based ways to well-being, one of which they called taking notice. Sounds familiar, right? Their description of a curious and open awareness of the world and what you are feeling has much in common with the definition of being mindful. That's why we were recently uh, asked to contribute to a workshop exploring the results of a government-funded study showing that British people tend to be particularly poor at taking notice. And in fact, the only, uh, the only, <laughs> the only wealthy European nation that seems to be worse at taking notice than us uh, are the Irish. Uh, <laughs> And you're mainly Irish, aren't you, Chris? You've got, you, you, you got it, all right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, this, uh, and this seems to be a significant contributor to the UK's poor well-being rating as compared to the rest of Europe. And I'm afraid to say that the US, I think, does, does poorly compared to the UK and Ireland. Uh, I, I should caveat here, though, that there's early days in terms of this approach to policy making. The prevailing argument for proper investment in mental health services, for instance, is still the related cost reduction in other services. The plain fact that adequate treatment of mental health problems would result in massive increases in national well-being is not yet a big part of the picture. This poverty of attention is fast becoming recognized as a symptom of the age, as Chris mentioned, and is by no means confined to the UK. It is rightly a source of concern from the point of view of education and economic productivity, as well as quality of life. And this brings me to a third important channel for mindfulness in the public conversation. I won't depress you with the horrifying statistics about the amount of time that we all spend in front of our screens. But in this all-consuming digital environment, at any given time, there's a tug of war taking place between you and half a dozen corporations to decide which way your eyeball is pointing. More, than, more often than not, you'll lose. In fact, more often than not, you're not even aware that it's going on. The world we live in is now expertly designed to attract, to distract and attract us, to manipulate our choices, and often casually short-circuit our free will. Digital developers now use what are commonly called growth hacking algorithms that, without human intervention, make apps, websites, and games more sticky they rapidly learn about what hooks us in, and they feed us more of the same. Commentators now call attention the most prized commodity, and it holds cold economic value to organizations who want to sell you things. Our inability to resist is their golden goose. And it's no consequence to them whether it damages us or not. How many of us protest that corporations are becoming too powerful? 
while handing them our most precious asset for free. In this context, the decision to own your attention is about more than mere focus or becoming more effective. To develop a mindfulness practice is nothing less than to take back autonomy, reasserting the right to decide what is deserving of your attention. And that's powerful. Deciding to be free and taking a step towards your liberation is a political act. So we see that mindfulness is primed to serve our changing priorities as a society in a number of promising ways. But perhaps more exciting still is the awakening recognition among policymakers that mindfulness could underpin a more fundamental kind of change. They're starting to ask not just how uh, <coughs> it can address specific problems, but how widespread cultivation of mindfulness might impact the very fabric of society. Asking what might happen if it becomes normal to acknowledge our tendency to live on autopilot and take steps to live in a more conscious manner. At a parliamentary event recently on the subject of mindfulness and social change, an, influ an influential UK politician, John Cruddis, said, mindfulness training could act as a foundational proposition to a whole series of public policy interventions over and above the obvious ones in healthcare in terms of how you can ensure that people live full, rounded, well-lived lives, connect with people for, uh, who live in different material circumstances and come from different communities. So what might John mean when he says mindfulness could be a foundational proposition for a well-lived life? Well, mindfulness practice helps us to inquire into the difficulties we all have in being human and to develop new ways of dealing with them. However our personal problems manifest, with mindfulness, we examine what seems to be a universal mechanism of human distress, by which I mean the reactivity that occurs when we don't want things to be the way they are. And this cognitive reactivity, as it's called in the academic literature for mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, is foundational to our suffering. This cognitive reactivity is foundational to our suffering, and reducing it is foundational to freedom and to flourishing. In service of this exciting possibility, it is vital to define our terms with a bit more precision. The word mindfulness has many uses. Sometimes it describes an awareness practice, sometimes it describes a type of awareness, sometimes it describes a method, method of stress reduction or cognitive enhancement. And as Pilar, Barry and Deb suggested yesterday, perhaps it's okay that there's a mindfulness light for some, as long as there's a mindfulness of depth for others. But the problem with mindfulness as an umbrella term is perhaps that its potency and potential can be masked by its more super, superficial applications. Mindfulness coloring in, for instance, or I'm sure you could name quite a few. What I'm really talking about in this fundamental social context and what's so exciting about this stirring political, political current around alternative metrics is what mindfulness with depth can offer us as a with depth can offer us as a society. I think we need to be much clearer about that and <clears throat> maybe even find another name that makes the difference more explicit. And Dan Seal talked earlier about mindsight, which could be one avenue of inquiry there. Because it's not just, because deep mindfulness practice isn't just more awareness, more calm, more kindness. The radical potential of mindfulness lies in the possibility it offers everybody of understanding the nature of our own minds, bringing our reactivity, I've lost my last page, bringing, bringing our reactivity, this universal mechanism of distress, into clearer focus so that we can step out of it and, in important ways, be free. We need clarity around this deeper opportunity in mindfulness practice so that those dabbling with mindfulness light understand what they're missing. And we need to validate it scientifically independently of mindfulness-based interventions, perhaps, so that when policymakers are trying to solve society's problems, mindfulness itself, as the potent and effective tool it really is. Sorry, <laughs> mindfulness presents itself as the potent and effective tool that it really is. So in a, in a, in a search for a way to sum up this remarkable opportunity that, we, that may be before us, I can do no better than John Kabat-Zinn, who in his foreword to the Mindful Nation report said, there is no question in my mind that the repercussions and ramifications of this report will be profoundly 
beneficial. Indeed, they will be addressing some of the most uh, pressing problems of society at their very root, the level of the human mind and heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we've got some uh, microphones going around, and I'd love to get your reflections on, on what's been said or to ask uh, about the uh, teaching program and, and, uh, and yeah, anything. We've got one here. So I can probably talk pretty loud, too. That, that uh, <laughs> One thing that occurred to me when, um, Chris, you mentioned the money spent in advertising around the world. Uh, I mean, I think that would be the epitome of the efficacy of mindfulness if we could be conscious of how advertising was manipulating us. But in the short run, has it ever been considered, I mean, it's only been a phenomena for about 80 years that advertising has worked at that subconscious level. Could that ever be legislated that we can't advertise that way? It, that, that has already been the case in Sweden. They have stopped advertising to uh, the children below the age of 12. So it can do. In, in, uh, in France, Sarkozy is considering uh, uh, banning size zero models, encouraging uh, anorexia and bulimia, bulimia in young girls. Um, David Cameron is, is also looking at aspects of advertising. What about well. us United States citizens being advertised um, as political guinea pigs? Have a word with him. <laughs> I started off my career in advertising. Um, <laughs> so I know a little bit something about this. <laughs> yeah, there, there, are, there, are, there are definitely certain techniques which, uh, you, which you can't do. Subliminal advertising, you know, flashing up pictures of things people aren't aware that they've seen but still affect their behavior. Um, you, can't, you can't do things like that. Um, so there are some rules, but they're not very strict, um, particularly in this country. But, yeah. it be but it could be legislated about, yeah. And then the, the, there was a really uh, uh, interesting report uh, released in 2011 uh, through a partnership, and one of the organizations with the, was the World, uh, Worldwide Fund for, for Nature, I think. Uh, uh, it was called Think of Me as Evil, uh, talking about the, um, the, the, the perils of uh, unchecked advertising. Um, and, uh, and so, the, the, yeah, there are people researching this and putting pressure um, on, on those, that, that kind of work, well, yeah. One of the adverts I couldn't get over, I've, I've been coming to America now for 35 years, three of my sisters lived there, well, two of them still live out here. Uh, but the, uh, it's the first time I've noticed last night and the night before adverts for antidepressants, and not even just adverts for antidepressants, but adverts for antidepressants to go with your other antidepressants. <laughs> I mean, and, and telling them, go and see your doctor about it, go and pester your doctor. I, I just, yeah. this so, it seems so unethical. You know, if you, if you need antidepressants, then let your doctor make that assessment without being nudged and pushed and pulled by, uh, by, by advertisers. It's unbelievable. Okay. Have we got any other hands? We've got one in the back there. One there. Hi, um, my name is Jennifer Breyer, and um, um, there's so much that I want to say going to try to be concise um, and I'm not going to apologize for <laughs> crying I'm just going to warn you <laughs> um, so I, I one of the things that I've been carrying with me this whole um, this whole workshop is um, or uh, conferences that over the last probably 20 years I've been trying to balance several roles and or archetypes that I embody, um, mother and healer, warrior, and um, civil servant. I've worked for the federal government since I was 17. And the first 10 years was as a United States Marine. So I was very thankful to hear you mention the, M the MFIT, which is a, um, a beginning but the focus is still um, mission readiness and performance as opposed to wellness. Um, and I was a counselor in the last four years as a Marine, and if you want to, learning Rogerian style as a Marine from Marines is something special. So, <laughs> um, 
Um, but the last four years, I, I um, was a counselor while active duty, and then I transitioned. I work for the, the VA now, the Veteran Affairs. Um, and they're working really hard to integrate uh, mindfulness practices, but it's really a lot of talk. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric. There's a lot of rhetoric in um, just in our culture about mindfulness and, and how it relates to veterans. Um, and what came up for me was the, a lot of the research says that PTSD more than anything is um, a result of moral injury and injury to our soul. Um, Edward Tick does a lot of work on welcoming, welcoming veterans back into our community, um, and that's what it's based on. Um, and so what I was thinking was that <clears throat> during this conference, this is, this is the first time that really I, I really heard us talk about like our larger system um, and one of the things that uh, is very near and dear to me is continuing to foster communication between civilians and military and um, you know so that we can really um, you know, that it's not only about, like, stopping veterans from killing the wrong people, because <laughs> that's really what brought about that change, but that it, we actually change our intentions in that we change our policies and we see more things like the, the um, Marine Corps had the, the FET teams, which is the female engagement teams, which was entire female Marine platoons or fire teams rather, that went into um, villages and engaged with the Afghan women. Um, and it gave me a lot of hope, like if the, Marine, <laughs> if the Marine Corps can actually honor, honor a space, it, it, and, and it was a beginning to a new way of maybe engaging the rest of the world. Um, so, I just, I guess I wanted to, to encourage us to continue the dialogue and then thank you as our partners. Um, and that there's nothing un-American about like what we're doing here. And it's very much in line with um, those of us that, you know, choose to serve. Um, and not only again, to, um, to save us <laughs> from ourselves, but also to, to guide us. So thank, thank you. There's definitely something I, I want to say to that, but perhaps we can have a, have a conversation afterwards. We've got five minutes left, and there's some other people who want to get a question in. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I would just uh, build on that, thank you for so much for sharing um, what you just did. And, and just to build on that, you know, the, the suffering that is throughout our world and comes in the beginning, I think, when we raise our children, I just wanted to underscore what you are leading us in, which is how to actually bring the government into this whole process uh, and really thank you for that. But I also want to, want to suggest that what you said was so powerful about the importance of making sure that personal practice is a part of everyone who is then going to convey this to children or adolescents and that without that um, it will not only water down what is taught but it will be that what is taught may not be what we have in mind. And the, the last thing I'll just say um, is that, you know, in the journey I think we've been on in the, during this conference, there's this opportunity to do something, um, and I tried to say it in the, in the keynote address, but I think you're, you're kind of living it, which is that the dropping out of this completely isolated sense of a separate self 
is such a deeply win-win-win situation, and yet people may not see it on the surface of the term mindful. And whatever term we encourage, and mindfulness is fine, and mindful awareness, or whatever we, we say, um, it, we need to really work at this level where the way culture is transmitting the idea of a separate self that can, in fact, become victim to all these different things that happen in advertising that you're talking about, the way we can actually allow this self not to be lost, but to be expanded and to include our connections with each other begins with how we teach children and how we support adolescents. And the win-win-win part of it is, you know, people will be happier, people will be healthier, and it's more living from truth. And thank you for coming over and inspiring us with your wonderful work, and I hope we'll be able to learn from the wise steps that you've taken. Thank you so much. There's a, go, sorry. I, I was curious if you have um, <clears throat> any anecdotes to share about the way discourse may have changed among the parliamentarians who've engaged in this. Um, you know, we have a, a terrible uh, pattern of discourse now in our electoral politics, and I was just wondering if you've seen any change from your work. It's, it's fun. I was just about to say something on that, on that note, actually, in response to Dan, so if, if you don't mind, I'm, yeah. I'll just... Um, uh, one of the members of the Upper House in the UK, the House, the house of Lords, was in um, a, a public hearing on mindfulness in policing that I was, that I was chairing as part of the inquiry. Uh, and and he, he shared an anecdote about how um, Parliament is a, an antagonistic and, and often aggressive place. You know, it's combative. That's the tone, even within your party a lot of the time. Uh, but when you, when you take time out cross-party to have these kind of personal practice groups, up to sort of 20 politicians from you know, a number of different parties often, uh, sitting in silence, but also talking about stuff that are completely different subject matter, you know, emotions, even, even the spiritual, he said. Um, and uh, you, you start to uh, yeah, drop into a different way of relating. And then when you're back out in the corridors of power and you spot someone who was in the class with you or you know from, from, that, from that, kind of, that kind of world and you go off and speak to them, you drop into that new tone. And the person who was walking down the corridor with you who hasn't been to the mindfulness class drops into the new tone as well because we do that as humans, don't we? We, we, we kind of adapt to the conversation style that we're in and the conversation, and, and the conversation topic as well. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's some evidence that that happens in corporations as a kind of halo effect, um, not just the people who, take the, who do the practice, but, but um, uh, more widely. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's one anecdote. I mean, I, but, but I'd hope as, as we're getting you know, 130 people now, if, we, if this keeps on going and we keep getting sellout, you know, uh, and they're not paying for it, but <laughs> if they keep, keep getting sellout classes, uh, you know, we've got two, three hundred politicians, who knows? You know? I, I, I would share Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan was asked this question yesterday, and I think t Tim's answer was quite realistic. Us being on this course isn't going to turn us into the age of Aquarius. You know, <laughs> there, there are certain things that will divide politicians, political philosophies, the economy, how we share the wealth, will be as divided as ever. But there are certain issues like defense and like uh, security, how we care for the elderly. And I would put this right at the center of that. Mindfulness, and mental well-being, uh, flourishing should be depoliticized. It should be apolitical. And I think having this all party group where you've got a labor chair, a conservative chair and a liberal chair is a way of, uh, of bringing us together on an important issue. And I think it could feed out for there, uh, f from there. But I, I wouldn't like to think, you know, if Donald Trump went on a mindfulness course, uh, <laughs> God forbid, uh, that, uh, you know, pe peace would b b break out. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think we've got to be realistic about that. Uh, when, when I, was, uh, when I uh, uh, lost the election last year, I had four conservatives who wrote to me and expressed their sorrow uh, that, that I'd lost. And three of those had been on the mindfulness course with me. So there, there is an effect, but it's, it's not as big as we'd, we'd hoped for. Uh, All right, thank you. I think we're out of time. Sorry about that. Come and speak to us afterwards, though. We're happy to talk.
And the, uh, we have um, our report can be found at um, themindfulnessinitiative.org.uk. So you can download the report there, themindfulnessinitiative.org.uk. Thank you.